Hello, everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Welcome to Today in Bitcoin. Today is January 31st, 2017, and we have a very, very special guest here today, the biggest guest ever on the show. This man is a living legend. He is the international man. He has been almost everywhere on this planet. He's got books out. He was an inspiration to me when I learned about him in 2011. It totally changed my whole perspective on, of the world, how I look at things, my business dealings, just my goals in life. Here is the legend, Doug Casey. Welcome to the show, Doug Casey. Oh, thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure. Now, right now, you are in beautiful Punta del Este, Uruguay. Um, I just wanted to point I that can, out. To, I, can, to, I, can, I can turn the camera around just in case people have not been to Punta. I think they can look out the window and see the beach. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, that's, that's the life, people. So my first question here is, obviously, this is, we talk about Bitcoin a lot on the show, but we talk about precious metals also. You are a huge part of the precious metals community. You go to mining conferences. You talk to so many people. What, what personally do you think about Bitcoin? And secondary, what, what do you hear when you're out? Do people actually talk about Bitcoin at these conferences at all? Or do you not hear much about Bitcoin? Hmm. Well, my problem is that although I'm a technophile, uh, I'm not very good when it comes to the practical application of computers. So this is the reason, I suppose, I didn't get into Bitcoin early, back when it was trading for pennies. Uh, would have been one of the great speculations of all history. Uh, I was introduced to it in Cafajate, Argentina, uh, I don't know how many years ago, three, four, five, I can't remember, by a Belgian guy named Tour de Meester. And he was a, a big Bitcoin guy, and he actually gave me a physical Bitcoin. It's actually a little coin. I guess it has the code on it. And uh, I was trading it around, what was it at the time, Three, $13 at the time? So I bought tour lunch, and I thought, well, this is great. I'll just keep this as a souvenir. Uh, little did I know. So I'm favorably inclined towards Bitcoin, and I'm sure that the technology in back of it is going to have a major impact on many, many art markets. But I've never gotten involved in it because I don't trust my own lack of competence in the computer. So it's, it's a storage issue for you. You, you, don't, you think you would lose them possibly or something. Uh, that's part of it. Um, and uh, I don't even like to do online banking or online brokerage. Uh, this makes me a dinosaur. I understand that. But at the same time, if you don't have a high level of competence with the computer, you don't know what you don't know, and uh, mistakes can be made. So, all right. So, in in the precious metals community, is there any talk of Bitcoin, or is it or is it just being ignored? I've I've from some people, I get the feeling that some people are kind of almost scared of Bitcoin, feel like it's a competitor. When I feel like they just go hand in hand, they can precious metals and Bitcoin can be friends. You can like both of them. Well, I agree with you. And there's a company uh, called BitGold, traded in Vancouver, that I'm a significant shareholder of because I was a significant shareholder, a founding shareholder, actually, of, um, of uh, Gold Money, Jim Turk's company. And uh, it merged with BitGold, which has made it into a product. So oh, I view Bitcoin mechanism. In other words, I guess if you know how to use it properly, it's a great way to send money anywhere in the world using the SWIFT system or without a bank going forth. So I think that's the main utility of it. But, um, Now, you're, you're breaking up a little bit on me there. Can you still hear me all right and see me? Yeah, I guess it was just on my end. Uh, what do you want me to say again? Uh, no, no, you were saying the main utility of Bitcoin was sending money around the world, I believe. Yeah, it's a transfer mechanism. Yeah. It it's allows way you to ob obviate the banking system 
and the SWIFT system and so forth. Yeah, and so for a person who obviously travels and you, one of your philosophies is, you know, not to have all your assets in one country, to diversify from country to country. If you have Bitcoin, if, if you have it on you um, and control your private key, it's, you can take it from country to country. It's not stuck in one country. And I thought you would like that aspect of it also, which kind of plays off of what you were saying uh, just now. Uh, now, obviously, Bitcoin isn't the only cryptocurrency that's out there. Um, in, in, in your circles, do you hear about any other cryptocurrencies or is Bitcoin just synonymous with cryptocurrency? Uh, in my circles, which don't center on Bitcoin, everybody's aware of it, and everybody that I know likes the principles, the idea of it, I think the only other one that we've heard of is Litecoin, and nobody knows anything about that. Uh, okay. But um, I think that what's going to happen is that the U.S. government uh, is going to try to Uh, Bitcoin, Fedcoin, uh, trading in parallel with it. I think that would be a clever move on their part. So uh, I don't know what the ultimate value of Bitcoin could be. Much higher, much lower, I don't know. But you're going to get competition from governments and so forth. And I wouldn't want to use the government currency for the obvious reasons. There's no reason to trust the government. Although the average person will trust the government and will prefer that. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think most Bitcoin people have, or many, have no trust of the government. So, to get into a centralized uh, cryptocurrency like that is is not appealing. But sure, the government wants to force everyone into something that they can monitor, and uh, I'm sure that's the goal of, of many country, uh, many countries' uh, monetary policies. But um, but Bitcoin will always be there as the free market option. But it is interesting that you heard of that you heard of Litecoin. That is intriguing. And well, what, I think, what have you heard about BitGold, the Canadian company that allows you to transfer gold and Bitcoin easily? Well, here's the thing. It's, it's a centralized, it's a company, it's centralized. So something could go wrong and oh. you, could lose, you could lose your money. That, that's, I mean, that's the only talk I really hear about it. Um, on my end is when people bring up services that are centralized, they're, they're worried when using I mean, and there are people that are very interested in buying gold with Bitcoin, and that, and that's how I've heard about it too. So I've heard some positive, but I've heard some you know worries too, because for people like to control their Bitcoin at all times and not give it to a third party. Uh, that's that's one of its uh, benefits, I guess. So, um, but I, I definitely have heard of the company, and I, I'm sure everyone here is uh, that's less watching today is has heard about it. Uh, but moving so, and, and again. For someone of your great financial stature to, to know about Bitcoin is very reassuring to so many people who are watching this right now. And that people in your circle are, know about it is it's, it's great. It's just, it is very reassuring. I, I think, you know, you tell young, moving on to, I guess, a little bit of off Bitcoin subject, you tell people, young people, they should go to Africa. That's where there's so much financial opportunity. And I actually went there. And I believe that you know, so, so when some people hear that, they don't, they're like, well, what am I good at? What's my, they hesitate, well, they hesitate for a number of reasons, but they don't, they don't have a field. And I would like to say that I think Bitcoin is the reason people should go out there. I think maybe you can incorporate that into your future uh, things that you, when you advise people, because the people of Africa, they want Bitcoin. They, they want what I, what I saw in person. They just, they seem to, just crave it because their governments crack do all sorts of financial shenanigans, as you know. Um, do, do you, off the top of your head, is there a country in Africa where you just you think Bitcoin would do well in terms of they they crack down at gold on the border? They don't let you take your wealth out at the border, but inside they're not very technologically sophisticated so if you're running a bitcoin operation they wouldn't even know and excluding angola angola meets that but it's very it's very difficult to get into angola for americans well i am a big fan of africa uh i like it because 
it's full of chaos, which is exactly why most pe financial people don't like it. But when you have chaos and disorganization and lots of corruption, because uh, every government in Africa is terminally corrupt, uh, this presents opportunity. And I recommend it for any person from an advanced country, like any place, US, Canada, Europe, uh, you want to go someplace where you're on an on-level playing field. You don't want to be on a level playing field. You want to go someplace where you have a marginal advantage over everybody else. And since very few people travel to Africa these days, well, they'll go to South Africa or Kenya on a safari, but that's got nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going to obscure countries and doing things that the tourists don't do. And you'll find that you have knowledge, connections, assets far above other people. And you can quickly become introduced to the top business people. You could be sitting down in an office with the president of the country in a week or two while you're there. So that's where the opportunity is. Also, I've got to point out that the demographics of the continent are very interesting and set in stone. Uh, most people are completely unaware that by the year 2100, about 42% of the world's population will be Africans. It's amazing. Something That's to amazing. bear in mind. It is. It is. So it's, it's growing fast, lots of opportunity. But as you know, young people today in America live in a very, I guess, the clean freak type of society where they want to be comfortable. They want all the modern amenities and they want them now. One thing about Africa, and this is a question I have never heard anyone ask you, that scares a lot of people off is malaria. When you, you've spent a lot of time in Africa, did you take malaria pills? And um, no. never. Well, well, Adam, first of all, I want to recommend that all of your listeners read my novel that was just published called Speculator which is the story about a 23-year-old guy that goes to Africa and um, a lot of money into $200 million and gets involved in a bush war and all kinds of things like that. One of the things that I talk about in the book is we talk about lots of different things in the book. It's quite educational, uh, disguised as an adventure novel, is malaria. And I've spent a lot of time all over Africa, never taken pills, uh, because there are too many side effects for them, number one. Uh, there's no guarantee that the pill that you take will be a prophylactic for the particular strain of malaria that might be in the area. And I've never gotten malaria. Maybe I've just been lucky so far. <clears throat> and uh, I have uh, medical friends that say, no, 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 things have changed. The new prophylactic malarial pills are much better without the side effects, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, consult the proper doctor of, of tropical medicine, but uh, I haven't experienced malaria as a problem. Okay, that, that is very reassuring to people out there, I can tell you, because uh, Americans feel, uh, fear disease, they, they fear a lot of things. There's a lot of fear that par paralyzes young people, which is really unfortunate. It, well, it, it's, 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 it's really a pity that it seems like a lot of young people in the US automatically try to go from high school to college. Big mistake, expensive mistake, a corrupting mistake. I advise against it very strongly. Uh, and most young people act like potted plants and they think going to Europe is a risky adventure. Uh, so they've got to change their attitudes or, well, this is part of the continuing decline of Western civilization which has been going on since about the time of the First World War, but it's reaching a climax at this point. Uh, really a pity. Yeah, it, it is. And it, it appears so many, I think, young people almost want to be plants. They want to plant themselves. And I think you inspire people to get off their butts and do stuff. Now, what, what do you think, I mean, you don't preach all happy flowers. You talk about, you know, that there could be economic troubles ahead. Oh, um, there will be. Plan your life around that. 
No, but but I now how do you balance that? Because there's some people out there, all they talk about is the end of the world. And I think people get put down by that. There there has to be a balance. I think you do a pretty good job of it. So what what do you think about all the super doom and gloomers that are like I mean how should one balance one life? Because if you get if you get too stuck in this doom and gloom paradigm, all you do is you end up at home watching the computer and you know trying to curse at your political leaders and you end up doing nothing. I You're absolutely correct. Well, to start with, it depends on your time frame. And uh, I'm a fan, uh, an aficionado of ancient history. I can say this, that ever since 200,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens appeared as a species, that it's been a constant upward trail for humanity. And since the Industrial Revolution, uh, our ascent, the ascent of man has gone into hyperdrive. I'm convinced that if we were to have this conversation 100 years from now, we could very well be not only on a, a moon of Saturn very easily, we could easily be on a different star. Uh, so I'm very optimistic for the future. I'm very optimistic that people will continue to produce more than they consume and save the difference. There are more scientists and engineers alive today than have ever lived in all of the world's previous history put together so there's great state which is the enemy of any free man is really a cancerous stage and uh I, I think we're on the edge of a major economic cataclysm much worse than what happened from 1930 from 1929 to 1946 so there are hiccups along the way and I think we're about to have one. But um, I don't know if that uh, gives you my perspective adequately or not. No, it's good. And dur during a hiccup, people can still make money. People, I mean, you just, I just, the way I see the world is, I mean, you always talk about the 80%, 20%, 20% of the people are bad in this world. I, I think that's, I, I might be kind of messing up what you said, but in a sense, I feel like only about 20% of people in this world ha are proactive enough to just, think outside of the box so if you're one out of five you've got a chance you've got a shot at doing really great things i don't think people realize if they how great a shot people have if they just do things a little bit different because 80 percent of the other people are going to just follow the mindless zombies you're absolutely right <clears throat> most of success is just showing up and this is why i emphasize africa for people that have some get up and go you got to go who aren't that are competitive with you. So if you're, a, if you're an American or a European, that is where the action is. And just showing up will put you head and shoulders above the crowd. Absolutely. That's why I put that in Africa. All right. So now we've, we've talked about the book a little bit. Um, you're, you have another book coming out very soon, correct? The, the sequel. So tell us about that. Well, Speculator is the first of a sextet of novels reforming the unjustly besmirched reputations of six highly politically incorrect occupations. So our hero, Charles Knight, after having made a huge amount of money and lost most of it, had it taken away from him in Speculator, now goes on to be a drug lord. And here I re re reform uh, the legal, uh, the reputations of the legal and illegal drug businesses. How you get uh, the morality of various types of drugs. And uh, that's coming out in July. And then we get more radical from there. As we move in each successive year, Charles becomes an assassin, which is a morality trail. He becomes a terrorist, which is very, that'll be an interesting book because I have a lot of views on Terrorism is a method of warfare, um, the morality of it, methods of it, and so forth. And then he becomes a warlord, and finally, it turns out he's the Antichrist. But um, he's a good guy. So it's basically a debunking of uh, conventional religions. So I think people will get more and more interested in the series, although Speculator has won a couple of big prizes so far, and I'm very pleased. 
So uh, Speculator, is av that's available at Amazon.com or? Yeah, that's the only place you can really buy a book these days because, you know, there's 1.5 million new books published every year and they're all saying me, 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 me. And bookstores no longer exist for practical purposes. So Amazon is where it's at. So if people go to Amazon and look for Speculator, Doug Casey, I think they're going to be in for a thrill. I'm going to link to that below this video. I'm going to link to all of Doug Casey's information. Well, I thank Doug Casey for being on the show today. It has been a pleasure. It has been an honor. Do you have any more thoughts on Bitcoin, Africa, a country where some people should just go to, maybe Malawi or something? They speak English there. That makes it easier, right? Mm. Any, any closing thoughts? Well, my last, my last trip to Africa was to Zimbabwe uh, about 10 months ago. Um, and Zimbabwe is pretty close to the bottom of the barrel right now. They've done everything they possibly could to destroy their economy. As far as Bitcoin is concerned, one thing to bear in mind is almost every African, after they, after they buy a suit of clothes and have enough food to eat, they buy a cell phone. They've all got cell phones. And uh, once they become familiar with the cell phone, and especially after they get a smartphone, obviously, uh, then Bitcoin is a natural for them. So um, this is an argument for uh, Bitcoin uh, taking over that, con over that continent because every currency in Africa is a piece of toilet paper, controlled and good only within its own borders, inflated out of existence. It's a horrible situation. So there's no question in my mind that the Africans, because they all have cell phones and because the, the local currencies are so horrible, they're going to go for an alternative, and that's probably going to be Bitcoin, uh, to a lesser degree gold because of the culture. But So I think you're on the right track that way, Adam. I really do. Excellent. Well, th those are good closing words. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Thank you again, Doug Casey, for coming on. Um, have fun down there in Uruguay. Everyone, I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Remember to subscribe to this channel, like this video, share this video, spread the word. It has been a pleasure. Goodbye, everyone. See ya.